afternoon and a very warm welcome to this afternoon's information session by Education USA Chennai Center. My name is Aparna Chandrasekharan and I'm an Education USA advisor. We have a very special session today and a special visitor who is going to talk to you about competitive STEM programs and admission to those programs in the United States. Um, I have the privilege of introducing to you Dr. Razi Naleem who is the Associate Dean for Research at the Purdue School of Engineering and Technology in Indianapolis. Uh, he is also a professor for mechanical engineering. He has had a very illustrious educational background and uh, professional background. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, share with you all that he, after completing his uh, Bachelor's of Engineering at the at, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, uh, Dr. Uh, Nalim pursued his Master's in Mechanical Engineering at Cornell University, followed by a PhD in Aerospace Engineering, also at Cornell University. Uh, he has several years of experience in industry, academia, and government, uh, including graduate education, technology, R&D, project-based learning, clean energy, and public outreach. Many of his projects have been funded by uh, uh, huge institutions like the US National Science Foundation and um, uh, grants from NASA and uh, uh, industries like NSF, Rolls-Royce, etc. So as I mentioned, he's currently a professor at IUPUI, and we are very privileged to have him join us to present this session. Over to you, Dr. Nadia. Thank you, Aparuna. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome again uh, to the program in Chennai. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about admissions to competitive STEM programs in U.S. universities. Uh, the United States uh, has a very dynamic economy, and, and there are many opportunities for education and uh, career-oriented uh, 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 higher education in, in the U.S. in particular. Uh, what you see in the United States is that the creation of knowledge and the application of knowledge is often very well integrated that allows you to participate in research uh, and uh, be able to contribute uh, to uh, the advancement of technology in STEM fields and uh, the advancement of science as well. So I'm going to talk about how you can get involved in the opportunities in the U.S. for higher education. And the cost is, is something that people will be asking about, but I believe it's going to be very reasonable when you look at the overall opportunity. I first want to talk about some characteristics of higher education, in particular in the U.S., but also the education uh, system uh, that may have some differences uh, with India because it's important to understand uh, the similarities and the differences when you are uh, thinking about going to another country. Uh, so one of the things that you should be aware of is that in the high school um, education process, uh, typically the U.S. Um, the students study a very broad range of subjects in contrast with typically in India uh, you would tend to specialize in to one stream such as science or arts or commerce and so on. In the U.S. generally that's not the case. There's a very broad education right up to the 12th grade and that has implications for uh, the way that the curriculum is uh, structured particularly in the earlier years of a bachelor's degree. Uh, the other thing is that uh, a very large percentage of the population goes to college uh, in the U.S., goes to universities, and, and so there's a very uh, diverse set of interests and uh, diverse opportunities that students are interested in, and so uh, you might find that that's somewhat different from what's typical in India, and, and that, you can see this graph shows that, you know, there's a continues to be a steady increase as well in the percentage of people who go to college uh, or university. Uh, another uh, characteristic is that uh, there are many, many fields of study um, at the bachelor's level as well as at, 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 at uh, higher levels, and, and those fields are um, uh, interesting for, for many people, uh, and some of them might be not available in, in all countries. But again, those will be able to accommodate uh, people of many different backgrounds. Uh, just a few moments uh, earlier when I came into the, uh, into the U.S. consulate, I had the opportunity to speak with a young lady that's interested in motorsports engineering, which is a very specialized area that happens to be taught in my 
uh, universities. So that's just an example of how very specialized fields might be available. And the other thing I want to emphasize is that the United States uh, is a place where the best talent from all over the world go, particularly for graduate education. And so for a master's or PhD degree level of education, you're going to be competing with really the best minds from around the whole world. And so you, if you're going to be studying for your PhD, for example, you really have to prepare yourself to compete in that environment. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Sri Lanka. I studied in India and then went to the United States. So I have had educational experience in three different countries and I have been a foreign student in two countries. And so um, I think I have a little bit uh, of an idea of how it feels like to go to another country to study because I've done it twice. Um, the graduate uh, education process I'm going to talk about uh, uh, right now, and then I'll also talk about the undergraduate education. Uh, if you think about graduate education, uh, the admission process is, um, is uh, uh, determined by every individual department. And every individual department has its own way of thinking about how to select the best candidate, what should be the process, what uh, background should be considered, and so on. GRE uh, is important in almost every department. Uh, in my university, uh, it, it's important in, in, in most departments. Uh, the, uh, your your um, graduate, uh, your your your, your uh, GPA, um, your um, uh, letters of recommendation, statement of purpose. These would be all typically commonly required by most departments. But depending on the department, uh, they will also be looking at other things like have you had any research experiences, any projects that are relevant uh, to the studies you're interested in, any publications. So particularly in STEM fields, those would be important. There may be other fields where they may be looking at other materials or achievements. But in the STEM fields, typically any research and publications will also be important to look at. Just a comment about the GRE. Uh, you should try to score well in all three components of the GRE. Um, it just taking the uh, total of the verbal and quantitative might not be the way that they would look at it, which is commonly sometimes the way students might be looking at it. But you really should be trying to have a high percentile score in each of the three areas. A little bit about uh, opportunities for assistantships and partial scholarships. Uh, many universities will, will offer some funding, some financial aid at the graduate level. Uh, typically, most of the funding would be allocated for doctoral students, PhD students. Uh, those students would be expected to make a significant contribution to research and teaching. And, and, and so that is a very high value for us as faculty members. Uh, that that, that uh, um, uh, means that we would like to uh, use a lot of the resources that we have to support PhD students. But there are also some scholarships for master's level students as well. I would recommend that if you're interested in doing research at the PhD level and even at the master's level, it's very important for you to uh, do some research on the internet and through other resources and find out what every individual professor in a university that you're interested in uh, and, and in your particular area of interest, what those professors are publishing. Because that will tell you how active they are in research. Uh, if there are a lot of recent publications, that probably means they are very active. Uh, that probably means they have some grants, perhaps, uh, that might be able to support you uh, in your research at, at some point. And then talk about. Uh, what you have read and, and uh, relate that to your interests when you write an essay or statement of purpose for that particular university. So that's something that will really catch the attention of the professors. Um, this is a little bit about the actual steps in the application process uh, that would be typical. This is taken from my university, but this would be fairly typical. They're going to verify admission requirements and 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 you know you're, you're going to see whether you know you are a good fit for that university uh, you usually would have an online application these days back when i was a student it was all paper and and mailing but now it's all 
mostly online. Uh, you'd submit the, de de uh, the documents to the department uh, through whatever process they have in place. And then the department would do the evaluation. There's usually a graduate committee, graduate admissions committee, and they would then tell you whether you have been admitted or not and whether you've, you're going to receive any financial aid. Sometimes there'll be some scholarships that are available from um, a, a um, sort of a university-wide committee, for example. Uh, so especially for, the, uh, there are some very prestigious fellowships that would, be, that would be decided at a higher level than the department. And usually that requires a nomination by the department. That's how it is at my campus. We would nominate the best students, the best applicants for university fellowships. And then if you are you know, selected by the fellowship committee, then you would also hear from the university about that. And, and then usually there would be an admission letter th that for international students would usually come through some kind of an office for international affairs uh, or something like that that would tell you about the visa uh, requirements and the documents for the visa and so on. Uh, for the undergraduate uh, uh, students uh, that are applying for undergraduate studies, it's, it's fairly similar, but what's different is that uh, typically all of this would be done at a university-wide level rather than by individual departments because you might not even uh, be actually uh, reviewed by the department uh, where you are interested in studying or where your major might be uh, because they're, uh, they're looking at a large number of students who might, you know, may come into one department but may change their minds and decide to study a different major. So um, you, you should be, of course, taking the SAT or the ACT uh, uh, for, for admission to an undergraduate program and every university will have probably some guidance on the scores needed. Uh, the TOEFL or uh, equivalent other examinations would be required and, and so you should practice and prepare for those. Um, as I uh, mentioned, you might have a particular major in mind and, and, and or you might be not quite sure, but I would recommend for international students that you should focus on a major that is of your current interest and, and talk about that in your essay uh, for your application. Uh, you may later change your mind and, and change to another major that's very common in the U.S. And uh, by the way, I should mention that um, even if you have studied in uh, a particular stream in, in India, you may want to switch to a, a major that's in a different stream. So for example, you may have studied commerce, but maybe your interests are more in engineering. Now that seems like a big leap in India, but I have seen students do that in the US. You would have to take some additional courses once you go there, but it is possible. Uh, so you can apply for a, a major in, in an area that might be somewhat different from what you've studied in India. Um, Should we ask question now or defer it later? I believe we would want to time. wait because uh, we're, we're, we're probably timing this. So, so I'll just uh, keep going and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions later. Uh, one thing that, that you might consider um, uh, because of uh, the fact that you might be taking some fairly in-depth uh, uh, subjects in your plus two, for example, that you may be able to take some advanced placement uh, exams and get credit uh, for your uh, knowledge here. But usually that is something that's arranged by schools that have a preparation process for those advanced placement exams. But you might want to look into that. Um, and, and of course you should have uh, you know, your school records uh, and, and if you've done any university studies as well, uh, all uh, available for the application. Um, so um, uh, the fact that the, the system in India at the high school level is somewhat different from in the U.S. has advantages and disadvantages and so you might think about you know, what the advantages are and what, how you might be able to you know, use that to your advantage. Um, the um, documentation typically for first year students uh, would be all of the official records, proof of English proficiency like the TOEFL score, the SAT and ACT scores, uh, 
um, a financial documentation for visa purposes, um, and uh, some other details, such as if you've been uh, out of school for a while, then you might want to discuss what you've been doing during that time. <laughs> Um, if you happen to have a U.S. visa for a different purpose, you should, uh, you should explain that because that might affect how the visa would be processed and, and, and then your passport information and so on. Um, so all of what I've talked about is, is quite general about higher education in the United States. I'm going to now talk a little bit about my own campus, my university, which is um, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. So it's actually two universities that share one campus in the city of Indianapolis, which is uh, not far from Chicago, if you look at the US overall, uh, in the state of Indiana. It's a comprehensive uh, research university in an urban location. Uh, it has uh, a lot of research centers and a lot of research funding. Uh, because of the fact that the Indiana University Medical School is located on our campus, which happens to be the largest U.S. public medical school, uh, there's a lot of uh, health-related research uh, that goes on in many different schools on uh, our campus. Uh, but in addition, uh, we have uh, a lot of industry locally, and that uh, uh, allows uh, many of the departments to also engage in research that's relevant to industry as well. So, uh, so it's a very comprehensive uh, campus, uh, and I belong to the School of Engineering and Technology, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and, and this slide just gives you a little bit more information about uh, the number of students and degrees. Uh, we have about 2,000 international students representing many, many countries. Uh, I want to emphasize that um, our campus awards Indiana University degrees in certain fields and Purdue University degrees in certain fields. Uh, so it's actually two separate universities that share a common campus and award uh, degrees in e from each of those universities. Um, the Engineering and Technology School uh, to which I belong and the School of Science award primarily Purdue University degrees. And the other uh, schools, uh, is about 15 or 20 of those schools, uh, they award Indiana University degrees. And in the general uh, uh, area of um, medicine and health-related fields, those will be also all in, uh, uni Indiana University degrees but the STEM areas will be Purdue University degrees. Uh, in my school, which is the Purdue School of Engineering and Technology, we have about 3,000 students at, at the various levels, PhD and, 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 and masters and, and bachelors. Uh, we do have research in a number of different areas, which I will go into a little bit more. Uh, but I want to mention that one of the opportunities that we have is a five-year bachelor's and master's uh, program, combined program for the very best students. So that requires you to have a higher GPA at the undergraduate level in order to be eligible for this accelerated program that allows you to get a master's degree uh, uh, in about five years uh, from the start of your undergraduate studies. Uh, and uh, we have uh, some unique degree programs on my campus that are, are not very common. Uh, the Motorsports Engineering Bachelor's Degree Program is one of those. We also have an Energy Engineering Degree Program that is quite unusual at the bachelor's degree level. So uh, those are Purdue University Engineering Programs that are only available on my campus. Uh, we also have some master's programs that are not common available in, in many places. There's one on facilities management and one in music technology that uh, might be of interest for those with very specialized interests. Uh, the um, other areas where we have undergraduate degree programs include some of the more traditional areas like mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, computer engineering, and so on. And we also have a number of engineering technology and computer technology degree programs uh, as well. And um, in, in those areas, uh, uh, the um, 
specializations uh, are uh, very specific, as you can see on the slide. So interior design technology, for example, might be something uh, that is not very commonly uh, available in, in India, but that is a field that we have. So there are some very speci specialized areas that we have available uh, at the undergraduate level, both in engineering and in technology areas. At the postgraduate or graduate level, uh, we have uh, PhD degrees in biomedical engineering, in electrical and computer engineering, and in mechanical engineering. And, and those uh, degrees are actually um, uh, in, uh, uh, awarded by the Purdue University West Lafayette campus, which is the uh, larger and older campus of Purdue University uh, in the state of Indiana. So uh, the research could be done with professors in Indianapolis, but the degree is actually awarded currently by Purdue University West Lafayette. So it's the same PhD degree awarded uh, by all of the Purdue University campuses currently. Uh, the master's degree is somewhat autonomous, so it would be, it would say, awarded in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, and so we have uh, a number of fields that are uh, specifically available uh, in Indianapolis uh, in the different departments of engineering and engineering technology. Uh, what I want to say a little bit about now is uh, the difference between engineering and engineering or engineering technology in the U.S. Uh, this is a question that I'm asked and there's sometimes um, uh, different interpretations of the word technology in different countries. Uh, in the U.S., um, uh, technology programs are uh, distinguished from engineering programs by the way in which um, uh, technology is uh, designed and developed. In, in, in the technology programs, it is more uh, applied and hands-on. In the engineering programs, it is more based on fundamentals of science and uh, design based on uh, scientific uh, analysis. Uh, so uh, the mathematics um, expectation, the mathematics background uh, would be at a somewhat higher level in the engineering programs versus in the technology programs. Uh, but ultimately, it is more the way in which you apply um, the knowledge in different fields and employers really uh, are uh, looking for how well you can apply what you do and what you can do. Uh, we have uh, uh, our graduates have been uh, hired by many, many different companies uh, that are uh, looking at our Purdue University degree as really uh, a recognition of a strong level of um, capability in, in engineering and engineering technology. Uh, so uh, we have a number of companies that are uh, headquartered or have major operations in Indiana that are uh, always looking for hiring from our campus as well as companies in many other areas. And this is just a sample of those. Um, if you uh, get a degree on our campus, you'll find that there's a lot of assistance for placement and career services, uh, such as resume reviews and mock interviews uh, that will be very helpful for you to find employment once you complete your studies. Uh, while you're studying, there are a lot of facilities um, on campus that you might be interested in for recreation and sports. Um, and the city of Indianapolis is, is very nearby, and so there's a lot of um, restaurants, a, a lot of activities that you might be interested in. Uh, the Indiana, in, in Indianapolis Motor Speedway is not far away if you're interest, interested in uh, going to watch motor racing events. Um, basketball, uh, football, and so on. Uh, uh, there are stadiums nearby uh, to our campus. Uh, a little bit about undergraduate admission requirements again. Um, uh, we have uh, 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 established uh, these specific things that you would need to have. I think I've already mentioned some of these, so I'll, I'll, I'll proceed further uh, at the postgraduate level. Uh, 
uh, I would emphasize uh, again GRE scores as being very important in addition to st your statement of purpose that describes your background very well and your interests uh, and especially if you've had research experiences talk about that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just mention in addition to the opportunities for recreation there are also a lot of co-curricular activities that you might be interested in other extracurricular activities that are somewhat related to your field uh, that might be of interest. So there are opportunities if you're an undergraduate you can get engaged in research. There are some specific programs that support undergraduate research. Um, there are competitions um, like racing events or, or race um, teams that compete in certain competitions or races. Uh, robotics, for example, uh, would be another area where we have competitions that students can participate in. So these would be uh, what I would call co-curricular in the sense that they might be actually related to your studies, uh, but this would be not in the curriculum. It would be outside the curriculum, but it would support uh, your studies by getting engaged in these kinds of activities. Um, about uh, the costs, every university has information on their websites about the specifics of the costs, the tuition fees and so on um, and those numbers may change from time to time so I would encourage you to look those up uh, uh, so that you can get accurate information on the websites. Um, approximately uh, for on my campus uh, undergraduate tuition fees and insurance and, and books would cost about $33,000 a year uh, graduate tuition fees insurance and books would cost about twenty three thousand dollars per year based on the number of credit hours that you would typically take in a graduate program um, and then living costs we estimate to be around sixteen thousand dollars but these numbers as I said can vary and I would encourage you to go to uh, the website of my uh, university or the universities to get uh, most more current information uh, we do have a number of scholarships uh, at the undergraduate level uh, uh, that are, some of them are competitively awarded uh, and you need to submit a, a separate application. Some of them uh, you would be considered for uh, with your regular application. So again, that information changes from time to time and I encourage you to look on the website for that information. Uh, at the postgraduate level, we have some fellowships that are awarded at the university level. Those are the most prestigious. Um, and then we have research assistantships and teaching assistantships uh, that are typically awarded by the school or by the department. Um, and then we also have some partial tuition awards uh, at the master's level. Uh, there's housing available on my campus, both on campus and nearby, very nearby, as well as uh, further away, if you prefer to uh, live in some particular part of the city of Indianapolis that you would like to uh, enjoy. And so we do have students that, that commute from uh, some distance as well as some that want to live very near to the campus. Uh, so if you would like more information on IUPUI and my school, those are the uh, links uh, on, on the web. Uh, so that's, that's hopefully uh, a lot of information about uh, the admission and, and the uh, uh, living and, 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 this, and the curriculum in, in my campus. I'll very briefly talk about some research areas on my campus uh, that we have, uh, we are particularly strong in. Uh, we have areas related to uh, vehicle safety and autonomous vehicles that are uh, supported by automotive, the automotive industry um, in uh, Indiana in the US and in fact even from outside the US so uh, Toyota for example uh, supports uh, autonomous vehicle research very strongly. Uh, we have a lot of research related to biomedical engineering particularly because of the proximity of the Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, we have research in the nanotechnology area that is very active and we have in research in the energy and renewable energy areas uh, that are also very active and then in addition we have some research that cuts across many different fields in terms of application uh, particularly uh, computational modeling information technology would be some of those areas data analytics machine learning and so on are 
areas that are coming up um, uh, nowadays. Uh, a little bit about life in um, the Midwest of the US, um, uh, particularly in an urban area like Indianapolis, uh, you'll find that there are people of many, many different backgrounds. And so um, you should not really assume that things you've seen on television really represent the US because the US is a very diverse place and um, you'll find people of, of many different backgrounds and many different uh, ways of life. Uh, so uh, I would I encourage you to think about you know, what your plans are. Are you planning to live in the US long term? Are you planning to go and come back to India after your studies uh, and, 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 and plan your life uh, you know, uh, in a way that um, is consistent with your values and, and, and your goals uh, because time is going to fly and, and very soon you will have graduated hopefully from a university in the US and you would like to be um, using that to, to, to your best advantage. So I encourage you to consider coming to IUPUI or consider going to any university in the US and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Certainly, Thanks. certainly. I have one question. Hey, thanks, yes, uh, thanks for doing it. Uh, elaborate on really right. this one. My question is specific to STEM uh, programs per se across US universities. Let's say that if my son wants to join CMU for robotics and, mm -hmm. robotics and technology, how do you backtrack it in terms of requirements? Or you take four or five top STEM programs in the US, or 10 different top 10 programs in the US, STEM programs in the US, how do you backtrack it in terms of requirements? How do you do it? Because by sitting in India, it's difficult to, other than SAT and subjects at AP, it's very difficult to get to know what are the different needs. So how, how, do you some, how, do you, how does somebody prepare themselves during 10th, 11th, 12th, so that at least 50% of the requirements is met before you get there? This is specifically on STEM not to do with Indianapolis. Right. Are you referring to... Uh, having actual credit for studies no, here study. or just preparation? Preparation, right? Profiling, okay. right? So, so, uh, so the question is about how do you prepare for undergraduate studies in the U.S. while uh, you are uh, in high school uh, in India? Um, and a, a STEM field on a specific uh, area of focus. And if you have a specific area that you're interested in, you know, can you prepare for that? I think uh, today, actually, you have access to a lot of information, so uh, you can certainly prepare yourself. I the earlier you uh, can think about how you want to, you know, what you want to study, uh, the more time you will have to prepare yourself. I would encourage you, uh, if you ha if you are uh, near enough to one of the uh, USIEF locations, that you can actually come in. Uh, such as to this location here in Chennai, uh, there are student advisors who can help you learn more about some specific areas um, uh, I so that you can be guided to while you are actually you know, doing your studies to, um, to um, learn more about those areas, to read more about those areas, um, and, and prepare yourself. I would say that um, the... Uh, major in, in, in any university in the U.S. Um, uh, would be explained in, in usually in, in fair amount of detail on a website of a university. So I know that on, on my campus, uh, every major, ha uh, they do have a lot of information about the courses that you would take and so on, about the curriculum and the uh, opportunities that you would have with that degree. Um, so I would encourage you to also read, read uh, thoroughly what's on the website um, and, and try to prepare yourself. Now, within the curriculum in India, you have to be successful in completing that curriculum. So you, you, you still, you know, you, you, you would have to focus on the subjects that you're taking um, and be successful in the examinations here in India because you want to have a strong grade in your examinations here. 
And that might not include all of what you're interested in doing later. So that's some activity, that's some study that you would have to do in addition to what you're doing in your program here. If I may just add, if you want to strengthen a student's profile, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do extracurricular, academically, and co-curricular wise also. So if, if your student can do internships, between ninth grade and 12th grade, you have four years in which to do this. You can do a lot of extracurricular activities, which could be sports, it could be music, you know, dance, performing, I mean, theater, any of that kind of extracurricular activities, or even model United Nations, those kind of things, because universities look for extracurricular activities uh, in their students' undergraduate applicants' profile. Additionally, in terms of co-curricular activity, if they can do some internships in their specific field of interest, like if a student's interested in astronomy, they could go to the nearest planetarium and volunteer and be part of organizing events there, anything like that it could be. Or if somebody's interested in motorsports or automotive in, in, uh, engineering, you could visit the nearest racetrack in, in uh, nearest to your city and maybe be part of activities over there. So it could be something like that as well. In addition to that, a student could uh, showcase that they have pot uh, extra potential in a subject by taking the SAT subject tests or taking even AP exams, which are actually university level courses which you're attempting while you're a student in grade 11 or 12 in, in high school. So these are ways in which a student can really build their profile to showcase to a university that they would be the right fit for that university. Correct, but here is a challenge, right? Let, let, let's see that my child wants to do a, uh, electrical engineering in Urbana Champaign versus uh, Purdue, right? And what uh, okay. Purdue is saying that they you need AP, which means that obviously subject SAT for math is needed. When you go to Urbana Champaign, they don't need the subject that they don't need AP. Okay. So what I'm looking for is more of a guideline. At least top ten universities. The I know I'm just I, how do you get that right? Top ten universities. I don't want to spend my time in uh, going the model United Nations if my son's focus is only in mathematics. If my son's focus is only in computer engineering, yeah. then Chennai does not have where to get a nice internship. You need to go outside of the country to get a decent internship. Not necessarily. I have a student who is very interested in mathematics who's doing this Raise a Mathematics uh, Foundation in Mumbai. He goes for their summer programs. And after attending that, he's been selected for a program Fantastic. at Princeton University. Get to know those information. So, is so that is diff that's the research you have to do to with the school. The school has to support you in doing that. Because we can't advise you on no, what the I student has to do. If I'm in Bangalore, then it is reasonably possible. No, it, 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 any city, the student can do things. You can take MOOCs online, which are free now. You can take it from MIT to EBX to Coursera. There are lots of options. It's a question of doing the research. Uh, correct, but the thing yeah. is, a lot of information. It's very you difficult to categorize. So, so that, 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 that kind of reflects on the fact that, um, you know, in the U.S., you know, there are a lot of different opportunities and universities often try to, try to distinguish themselves from each other by offering, you know, a, a different type of program from, you know, other universities. Uh, so um, you will not find sort of a very uniform set of uh, majors that are exactly the same in you know every university. Um, universities are very independent. The, the faculty are very independent-minded, and so they tend to create uh, a different flavor of every subject based on the specializations that the faculty members actually have and the background that they have. Um, and, and this reflects on the fact that uh, w the, the, the United States is a place where people have freedom and, and academic freedom is one of those freedoms. And we as professors tend to really, you know, take that very seriously. And we feel that, you know, we are not obliged to follow a lot of government guidelines and so on. We want to create the best opportunities for what we believe is the future of our fields. And so that results in a very differentiated and diverse set of opportunities in the United States. But it sometimes can look like um, you know, a, a, a tremendous amount of variation that, that one has to navigate through uh, when you're looking at it from outside. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. That was a nice talk. And my name is Ram Lakshmi. Here for my son who is in 10th grade now. Mm -hmm. So reflect the same uh, you know, anxiety as him. But the next question is about the summer programs. You know, we see a lot of information on summer programs in the US. And uh, me and my husband, we were in the US and we were back many years ago. So what I understand from that is it's just an introduction to those colleges. And I don't think it gives you any extra credit on your curriculum or learning. Or would you recommend the students to go for these summer programs? 
Um, so, um, so there are different kinds of summer programs. Uh, there are summer programs that uh, students who are already undergraduate students here would like to go and do an internship right. in the U.S. or in another country right. during the summer period. Uh, is that what you're referring no, to, no, or are you referring so to 10th grade? For the summer programs for the high, high school, school students, students specifically. Okay. So okay. The time doesn't, timing doesn't match yeah, it's in July, August. July. Yeah, but a lot of schools <coughs> now in Chennai are accepting it, and they're allowing. Yeah, you can get a waiver from their principal, and there are a lot of advantages <coughs> of the summer program. So. I'm really not sure whether this will be very useful. Uh, so before, uh, before I, uh, so the question is about summer programs uh, that students while they are in high school uh, can be involved in. Uh, but before I answer that question, maybe I can ask Aparna to explain that what that summer program means so that I can answer the question better. So, so the summer programs, it's usually a month long or a slightly longer, six, six to eight weeks usually. And uh, uh, it can be either, like for example, if you look at the Yale summer program, it is very subject specific. So there's something on economics, politics, and governance, and things like that. Um, there's something in the field of media and communication now available. So uh, they basically attend classes. They may not get credit for it outside uh, once right. they come back. So it might not, even if they do go back to the same university for an undergrad program, they may not get credit for it. So it's more like an exposure uh, to a subject and being in an American classroom setting. Secondly, um, it gives them the opportunity to see what a U.S. university <coughs> environment is all right, like, all correct. about, and campus life, what it's all about. So they live on campus and they attend classes. Thank you, Aparna. Yes. So, uh, so the kind of summer program that you would have at a U U.S. university, uh, 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 that would be, you know, very specific for you know each university. Um, I wouldn't make a very general statement about. Uh, universities in the U.S. In, because uh, those kinds of programs are very specifically offered uh, by those universities that offer those programs uh, with um, in, 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 in mind uh, uh, giving the uh, students, young people, opportunity to experience uh, uh, life in the U.S. and study in the U.S. Uh, before they decide whether they want to go to the U.S. long term and, and study there. So I would say, you know, really read the information from uh, particular universities very carefully uh, to understand that, to understand what you would be studying, what the costs would be, and so on, um, and whether you would get any particular credit for uh, studies in the summer uh, for in, at that university or at a different university. Um, so um, I, I would not you know, make a very general statement because those are very unique, uh, carefully structured programs. Uh, typically at, at um, the undergraduate uh, or, or before undergraduate at, at the high school level, if we bring people to campus, um, we are, uh, we're going to have very structured, uh, very carefully organized programs that take good care of the young people on our campus. There are some very specific laws that we have to follow, particularly young people under the age of 18. Um, they cannot interact with everybody around. They, they can, you know, they, they, everybody that interacts with people under 18 have to actually go through some background checks and so on. So those are very carefully structured programs. This is one thing USAIF can think about if they can really solve it. See what happens is, let's say that my son wants to do an economics at Northwestern. Then either one of us have to go along with him, stay there for six weeks, or put him in six weeks and come back. And then, uh, and then uh, the transportation within Chicago, and then going to Northwestern, coming back, all those things is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, but we can't do it for four no, years. No, I'm just saying. Accredited universities, it's a bit difficult for us to be doing no, that. No, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that. This know? is something, if, if not yeah. you, if somebody can think about it and how to solve it. I don't, we don't know how to solve it, basically. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> right. Any other so questions? So that's a very specialized question, but any other questions? Any uh, questions? Yes. My uh, son was born in the U.S., so he holds a U.S. passport. passport. But all his education has been in India. He's currently right. doing a four-year uh, bachelor's program in physics research mm -hmm. at Shivnadar University in Delhi. He's just right. started. And we were told that for students who do a lot of research during the four-year course, there are, uh, there are um, and, and I know it's difficult to uh, define the word enough, but kids who do a lot of uh, research are 
able to go directly for a PhD in the US, skipping the masters. Exceptional cases where they publish stuff and presented right, it. Right. So, um, so uh, the question is about uh, being able to do a PhD after completing the bachelor's degree without doing a master's degree. Uh, that is possible at some universities. Um, and so uh, a direct PhD is sometimes what it's called, uh, or there might be some other terminology, but that is possible if the student really demonstrates a strong background uh, in terms of preparation for the PhD program, having done some research, having done, uh, having some publications, uh, would be uh, indication of being prepared for a PhD program uh, directly after a bachelor's degree program without doing a master's program. Uh, so, but again, that's very specific to individual universities uh, and, and how the uh, PhD programs actually will be specific to particular departments because as I said at the graduate level, really every department has its own way of deciding who's prepared for our program. Uh, you know, is a bachelor's degree sufficient? Do they need to have a master's degree? or what specific areas, um, you know, there should be, um, uh, you know, that, that what, what particular preparation you, you would need. Uh, I do want to um, uh, answer, uh, I do want to talk about something uh, that came to my mind because of your question. You mentioned that uh, your son was born in the U.S. and therefore actually has U.S. citizenship. I was going to ask whether right. that makes a difference for scholarship. So, um, so in general, uh, if you have U.S. citizenship, there are some opportunities that other uh, citizens of other countries may not have because you're already a citizen of the US. You would be eligible for certain scholarships. You would be eligible for uh, certain uh, benefits, perhaps, that uh, you should look into uh, because you might not actually have looked into that if you haven't actually lived in the US all your life, but if you actually have US citizenship, uh, then there are certainly grants, uh, government grants uh, that are available, Pell Grants and so on, uh, that uh, may be additional to what you would have as an international student. So I would certainly encourage you to look into that. I have one question, follow-up question on this. Right. Uh, I have a daughter who's doing electrical engineering in India, mm -hmm. and then she's a U.S. citizen. Can she, I mean, is there any opportunity for an internship or more of a research or in Purdue for, um, for a summer program or something like that? She's in her second year now. Right, right. So, um, uh, so with respect to um, uh, being a U.S. citizen, um, there are certainly benefits at the undergraduate level that are significant. At the graduate level, uh, most opportunities, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to your question, but I want to just make a, a general statement that uh, at the graduate level, uh, uh, particularly at the PhD level, um, much of the funding that is available is um, really does not consider citizenship. It really considers, you know, your background and your and your, and your preparation. But there would be some uh, uh, fellowships that are specifically available to U.S. citizens, uh, such as there are some fellowships from the National Science Foundation that are for U.S. citizens. Uh, where you, you could apply directly to the National Science Foundation and with uh, some rec letters of recommendation and so on, uh, be able to get a fellowship and, and, and that would enable you to get into uh, some very good programs in the U.S. Uh, and, and again, that would be available for, for U.S. citizens. Um, now, the other question uh, that, that you asked is about summer opportunities uh, for students who are undergraduate students currently, uh, you know, uh, is, are there opportunities to go and spend the summer in the U.S. and do some projects, some research, and get some experience? Um, and yes, there are such opportunities, but again, they are very specific to, you know, universities and departments that want to offer that kind of opportunity. On my campus, uh, there are a few uh, professors and a few departments uh, that I know that do offer such opportunities, uh, but uh, we do not have uh, a general uh, school-wide or university-wide program that offers those opportunities. Um, I do get a lot of inquiries from students in India about 
um, you know, in my own research area about coming to my lab and, and, and doing a project in the summer. Uh, personally, in, in, in my own lab, uh, as a, a professor that, that is working uh, with uh, a, a lot of different um, um, uh, um, grants and some, some opportunities that I'm pursuing with companies and so on, um, I um, don't have enough time to uh, supervise or advise uh, a student that would want to come to my lab for two or three months. Uh, but other professors might be willing to do that. So it's, you know, it really depends on a, on a professor's um, that, um, you know, specific uh, program of research and the time that they have available to advise many different students and so on. Um, I feel like I could not really do justice, uh, you know, to provide really good guidance to a student that's going to be there for a couple of, year, a couple of months and um, I would um, be taking that time away from advising my PhD students and my graduate students uh, to whom I've already made a commitment uh, and, and, and they are going to be uh, having enough time to, to produce uh, some results, make some contributions some, and, 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 and enable us to have publications and so on. Um, so um, so in, in my own lab, I, I generally do not um, have uh, students, international students, that come just for the summer. Right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know what the, is, what the difference between an evening program and a regular program. Because in that university, we have to be the classes will be from their main campus and then sometimes the sister campus. So it will be all around the New York City. Right, so right. And, around the and, and, and um, uh, this is a graduate program yeah. that you're talking about. So the question is about evening programs uh, and graduate programs that are, that are offered in the evenings uh, in U.S. universities. These programs are typically uh, designed for uh, uh, people that are working full time during the day and they only have time in the evenings uh, to come to campus or even go online and, uh, and study and, 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 and uh, receive a graduate degree or a graduate certificate sometimes. Um, and those are not specifically designed for international students they are really designed for local students uh, at most universities. So uh, you would have to find out whether that uh, particular program like that uh, would be able to accommodate international students. How do they do that? Um, so you would have to really you know, inquire about that specifically. I just want to expand on, on, on that a little bit in that the US also, you know, universities offer, also offer a lot of online programs. Um, and uh, some online programs do not require you to uh, attend the university in person at all. You can do it all online. Uh, whether that's available for international students or not, again, you would have to specifically ask about that. Um, because it might even depend on uh, the um, policies of your home country. Because some countries will say, you know, you cannot award a degree to somebody who is uh, here, you know, on, uh, in our home country uh, without actually having operations here and so on. So that's a complicated question to answer. Aparna, you have anything to add to that? Okay. Yes, but then you can't do an evening program and get a degree from that program, right? You might, as on your F1 visa, student visa, there might be certain requirements that you attend full-time class, uh, you know, that will be one of the requirements on your visa. So they will not perhaps allow you to just attend evening classes and get a degree. So it is, in fact, it goes back to the visa on which you are traveling to the U.S. So that's why I'm saying reach out to the graduate admissions office and check with them on this, whether it will be in violation of your visa status if you take the evening program. 
and that's it. Okay. Any other questions? Very good. Any questions online? Uh, anybody out there that has asked a question? So the question is, can a student with a life science undergraduate degree switch to an engineering graduate program? That's an excellent question. Um, in general, um, you can change your field any time in your life and study something new. Um, uh, lifelong learning is really uh, wonderful. You, you, know, you, you know, the world's changing, technology is changing, uh, your interests may change. Uh, you may have had some work experiences that uh, make you interested in a new field. Uh, so yes, it is certainly possible to change and go into a new field. And in fact, you may have, you may bring some background that is very unique when you do that uh, to uh, a, a new field that you want to pursue. Uh, specifically about studying engineering after having uh, a background in the life sciences, I would encourage someone who has had uh, a background in the life sciences to consider studying biomedical engineering or bioengineering. Uh, there's a lot of new uh, research and activities related to um, engineering that is uh, focused on health, that's focused on biological systems, uh, uh, not only with respect to uh, medicine or health, but also with respect to um, bioreactors, for example, uh, that will uh, uh, process uh, sewage and create some useful um, outputs from that. So there are, there are many new fields that are at the intersection of life sciences and engineering. So I would say absolutely yes. However, you may have to prepare yourself with some engineering background that you may not have yet. So um, uh, that might require you to take some additional courses in um, engineering topics that are specifically uh, needed for uh, a particular degree that may be in biomedical engineering, for example, or bioengineering. Uh, where you may have the background in biology and the life sciences, but you may have to have some additional courses so that you have the prerequisites to take the courses in an advanced field. Uh, but I think that's, uh, that's going to be uh, very possible for you to, to do that, to go into a new area. Okay. Another question? Yeah, yes. It's like if I'm choosing a graduate program for project work, is it mm -hmm. possible to do my projects like interdisciplinary projects? Because in my current undergraduate project, I'm doing a cognitive biology project, uh, but that is that requires some knowledge about the instrumentation, electronics and instrumentation. So if I'm doing a project for my uh, master's degree, so is it possible to do an interdisciplinary project to come back work with a uh, uh, student from another department? It's like if it is an IoT project implemented in uh, uh, it's like instrumentation. So is it possible to do such, such kind of projects? So uh, let me uh, just to understand your background a little bit. So you're currently an undergraduate student? Currently an undergraduate student and, and uh, CSE. In computer science and engineering, yeah. right. And uh, you would be interested in taking, uh, doing a master's degree uh, involving Internet of Things or something like that? Or I'm interested in doing computer science. Computer science? Health, uh, information science, combined things. Okay. So, so as I understand the question, it's uh, about uh, being able to work in an interdisciplinary uh, project uh, which involves people in different departments. Uh, so uh, interdisciplinary and collab collaborative research across different departments is very common in U.S. universities and a lot of new fields in fact uh, are uh, emerging that require interdisciplinary work. Uh, so I would say that is, is very possible. Um, however, uh, a graduate student 
um, is generally uh, uh, going to be evaluated on your individual uh, work and your individual contributions. So when you're involved in interdisciplinary work, uh, which, is, which is a very good thing, uh, you may be working with people in different departments. You may have an advisor in multiple departments. You may have an advisor in, in your home department, but another advisor in a different department, which is great, you know, which really allows you to uh, tailor your program uh, very specifically to your interests. Uh, but at the same time, you should make sure that you are, you are very familiar with how you individually are being evaluated, whether it's for your project, whether it's for your coursework, and so on, because often that evaluation um, is following the process in a particular department, usually a home department. Uh, so as long as you understand how you're going to be evaluated, how your work is going to be evaluated, you, it's certainly very possible to, to work with people in other departments and do collaborative work. Any final questions? Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nalim, for that wonderful presentation and patiently answering questions from our in house and online audience. Uh, just a few more announcements for upcoming events that we're hosting. Uh, there will be a webinar on Saturday, November 10th. It's an online virtual event, so you'll have to go to our GoTo webinar platform uh, to log on. Uh, this is on November 10th, Saturday, 10 a.m. The topic is University of California Applications. It's for undergraduate students and parents. And uh, this will be presented by Kuka Acosta, who's an Associate Director, Admissions, University of California, Santa Barbara. So this is an online event. You will need to log on on Saturday, coming Saturday, and join that session. Uh, the next in-house event at the Education USA uh, Center here in Chennai uh, will be uh, a screening uh, of a film which showcases campus life in the US, uh, which will be followed by a discussion, uh, uh, which will be led by two American Fulbright scholars will give you examples of their own experience of being uh, on uni U.S. university campuses and the life and diversity on a U.S. university campus. This event is being held under the aegis of the International Education Week, uh, uh, which is being celebrated from 12th to 16th of this month. So we have a series of events uh, under that uh, uh, headline. And uh, this particular screening, film screening, is on November 14th from 2 p.m. to 4.30 uh, p.m. at the American Center here in Chennai. Uh, the next session also as part of the International Education Week celebrations is going to be on Thursday, November 15th. Uh, this is in the afternoon from 3 to 4 p.m. And this uh, session is titled Crafting an American Style Resume for a U.S. University Application. Uh, this is an in-house program at the American Center in Chennai. And finally, uh, on November 24th, which is again a Saturday, uh, and at 10 a.m., we have the next webinar for the month, uh, where the topic is Graduate Statement of Purpose. This uh, online virtual event will be uh, presented by Kathleen Joyce, who's Assistant Dean for Student Recruitment at Syracuse University. And she'll talk about best practices for writing a graduate statement of purpose uh, for the US university application process. This again is a virtual event. Uh, you may visit the usief.org.in website or the educationusa.state.gov website uh, to check for our monthly calendar of events and to register for both the online virtual event as well as for the in-house events at the American Center. Thank you so much for joining us today for this afternoon session. Thank you once again, Dr. Nali. And we look forward to seeing you uh, be part of some of our future events. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick request for all of you who haven't uh, ticked on this list, uh, who came today.